In this lecture, we will be discussing the diseases of the oral cavity. Here we have the structure of the oral cavity, as well as part of the larynx and the beginning of the esophagus. The oral cavity is the, a common entryway for both the GI tract through the esophagus and the airway through the larynx. So we know that when we block our nose, we can still breathe through our mouth. It's the common entryway for both routes. The structures of the oral cavity have multiple roles in their functions. The teeth, tongue, and lips, as well as the palate, not only participate in the mechanical grinding digestion part of food, but by moving the muscle structures of the tongue and the soft palate, it also helps with the pronunciation of words for speech. If anything were to happen to this part of the structure, it would not only affect chewing and digestion of food, but also pronunciation for speech. Within the healthcare team, there are SLPs, or speech language pathologists. They are the professionals who deal with one's speech, swallowing, and taste. Many patients, for instance, after a stroke, may have problems swallowing or speaking because some of the muscles that were affected by the damage to the brain. SLPs are responsible for rehab in these types of situations. Any damage to the oral cavity could potentially affect ingestion of the food, so SLPs and dietitians should work closely together. During your internship's clinical rotation or in your practice as a dietitian, it would definitely not hurt to have an SLP as a collaborator. One of the functions of the oral cavity is chewing. So that is motility. Obviously, chewing is essential for the mechanical digestion of food that we put into our mouth. So damage to the muscle or nerves that control the movement of the tongue or other muscle structures in the mouth cavity could affect the process, as could damage to the teeth or jaw. In addition, the oral cavity has a lot of secretions. One of the first that comes to mind is saliva. We have the different salivary glands that can secrete saliva into the oral cavity. And saliva has more than one function. For example, it is a liquid, so it helps add moisture to the, to the food when we are chewing to make it easier to chew. Also, when the bolus forms and we ingest, we swallow it and it goes down easier if it has some moisture. So basically it helps out by physically making the food softer in texture. At the same time, saliva has lysosomes which can kill germs that get into our mouth cavity. In infants and newborns, um, they have very active lingual lipase which can digest the fat from breast milk, although this enzyme becomes less significant when we reach adulthood, but it is very important for the newborn. We also have another digestive enzyme, the salivary amylase, which, which initiates the digestion of starch from our food. Physical assessment of the oral cavity is very important due to the fact that if anything happens in this part of the body, it could affect our dietary intake quite a bit. When we assess the oral cavity, there are many things we need to pay attention to. First, we'll need to see if all the structures are present and intact. And if there is anything missing or if for one re reason or another, we will have to think about the potential impact it would have on things like ingestion, swallowing, and speech. Oral disease, no matter which type we are talking about, can lead to nutritional deficits. For an example, dental caries, gingivitis, 
and periodontal disease are most common. These few examples are conditions that would be considered to have chronic inflammation. Although these are local infections, they release local inflammation mediators into the bloodstream. So these conditions can have an impact on the whole body. There have been some reports indicating that flossing our teeth properly on a regular basis could reduce our systemic inflammation level. This could reduce our risk for type 2 diabetes and other chronic non-communicable non -communicable diseases where inflammation plays a role in the process. This one simple habit or lifestyle practice could have a significant impact on our health. When we are discussing dental disease, depending on which population group we are talking about, we may have different challenges. For example, for the pediatric population, we are going to be focused on dental caries. It also does not affect all racial groups equally. Since dental health is associated with regular checkups for regular cleaning and other maintenance, Poverty is associated um, with the prevalence of dental caries as well. If someone has a regular checkup every six months with regular cleaning, then the likelihood for them to develop dental caries is much less compared to someone who maybe didn't have insurance or who couldn't afford this regular dental care. For the senior population, Data indicates that 7% of all Americans over the age of 65 have lost all of their natural teeth. This means that they will require dentures if they want to maintain the ability to chew. However, those dentures need regular checkups as well because over time, the gums may shrink with aging. A set of dentures may need to be replaced with a new set if it's not fitting well anymore. Then again, if the senior does not have health insurance, they may not be able to access this care in a timely manner. So these are all factors that can affect dental health and the ability to chew. Causes of dental caries include the structure of the teeth and our body's immune response to bacterial infection, as well as the composition of the saliva in the mouth, which varies by uh, person to person. For example, some people may have a higher mineral content in their saliva, and therefore they may have more mineral deposits on the teeth. This could attribute to the faster growing of plaque and calculus, which is the um, plaque that has been hardened. Once we have the bacteria attaching to the surface of the teeth, then we have the, black, the plaque. And if we do not remove the plaques, quickly enough, they will get rooted into and hardened on the teeth. Then it becomes calculus. The presence of plaque and calculus contribute to the increased risk or instance of dental caries. So we may want to know what's associated with these two things. There are many factors, including the frequency of eating, the stickiness of the food we are eating, composition of the saliva, the presence of buffer, and overall oral hygiene are factors. Regular cleaning, flossing, brushing, and cleaning by a dentist can all affect how easily someone develops plaque and calculus. Also, dry mouth or the lack of saliva can also increase risk in developing plaque. If we think about it, Saliva is liquid, so it helps to wash off the surface of the teeth. But if we are not drinking much liquid, say maybe like at night when we are sleeping, our saliva secretion is lower and the parts of our mouth cavity are not moving. So this could contribute to the overnight buildup of plaque. This is why some dentists advise if you ever get up in the middle of the night, try to have a few sips of water, which could help and also to make sure you quickly brush your teeth first thing after you wake up so that you are removing those loosely attached plaques before they become hard in calculus. To prevent 
plaque and calculus, we can use fluoride in the correct amounts because too much fluoride could also cause damage to the dental tissue and proper nutrition is of course important. If we think about it, our teeth are a special type of bone tissue, so it is a live organ. In order to maintain healthy teeth, we need proper energy intake, protein intake, as well as proper micronutrient intake, including vitamin C, iron, and of course, calcium. Here are the dietary factors and eating patterns associated with dental health. If we look here, those risk factors usually associated with the overconsumption or improper consumption of sweets, added sugars, or fruit, it doesn't make a difference because in this case, the sugar in the mouth cavity can easily be converted to acidic compounds by the bacteria, which will damage the dental tissue. So it's not like we can't eat foods that have sugar with them or drink acidic items. We just need to make sure to clean our mouths in a timely manner so that those compounds do not accumulate. Now let's discuss the inflammatory conditions associated with the factors we just mentioned. We have gingivitis, which is the inflammation of the gum. We also have stomatitis, or mucositis, the inflammation of the mucosa. When you see this IS at the end of the word, it usually indicates that there is some type of inflammation. For example, hepatitis is the inflammation of the liver. And stomatitis, we'll want to pay close attention to this term because if we just glance at it, we might mistake this for the inflammation of the stomach because the spelling looks like just the beginning of the spelling of stomach. However, in anatomy, stoma means opening. It could be a natural opening or it could be an artificial opening. For example, an artificial opening created by surgery. So please pay attention. This is not the inflammation of the stomach. It is in fact the inflation of the, the inflammation of the mouth, the mucosa. Usually when someone has stomatitis, it is also affected, um, associated with a fungus infection. We then have glossitis, and this is the inflammation of the tongue, and chelosis is the inflammation of the corner of the mouth. So here we can see an example of glossitis with the inflamed tongue. These conditions are often associated with certain nutrient deficiencies. It could be vitamins or minerals. So we definitely should assess the status of these nutrients if we see these signs. We also have conditions that can alter the function of the salivary gland. For example, Xerostoma, again, we have stoma representing mouth. This is the condition where saliva secretion is significantly decreased so the mouth is dry. As we previously mentioned, this can affect dental health among other things. Xerostomia could also be the result of different diseases or a side effect of medical treatment. Uh, both the medications and other types of treatment. So people who take certain medications may complain that their mouths are dry. Also, cancer survivors who have had radiation therapy in the facial areas, um, th this radiation can really damage the salivary glands, so their dry mouth may be more permanent. It's most likely going to be a lifetime condition for them post-radiation therapy. For the nutrition interventions for stomatitis, please study this table here carefully. Uh, number one, prevention is key. So regular oral hygiene practice helps. And you know what is recommended here would be ideal, but in reality, we may not have the luxury to say, clean our mouths every four hours. 
but doing it at bedtime is reasonable. Um, however, 24 hours would be difficult to do realistically. So we do want to be frequently cleaning our mouths as much as we can. There are other things we can do. For example, some dentists may recommend a deeper cleaning of everything below the gum line. And obviously this would not be something we could do ourselves, but um, could make sure that we get done by a dentist. Certain patients may, to, may need to receive oral surgery in the oral cavity. When this happens, it can temporarily or permanently change the structure of the oral cavity. For example, if someone had a certain cancer that needed to be removed, then they might be losing certain parts. Also, if there is any jaw fracture, um, at least temporarily, it needs to be fixed. One principle to treat, jaw, to treat jaw fracture is to limit movement. And if we limit the movement of the jaw, then we really can't chew. So all of this could affect our dietary intake. We can assess and diagnose a patient that has already had surgery in the oral cavity. And obviously the past diet in history is very important. And we often use the diagnosis of an adequate oral intake so we have that here. Whether it is for um, overall intake or for energy intake. And because this is post-surgery for recovery, for the wound to heal, we would require extra nutrients and energy as well. So perhaps increased nutrient needs. And Obviously, there may be biting, chewing difficulty. And if this process lasts a long time, we may also have involuntary weight loss. So weight history will be important to check. We'll wanna look at the usual weight and the weight before surgery, as well as the current weight to help us with our nutrition diagnosis. For nutrition intervention, this would depend on which surgery and what their status is post-op. We may need to make modifications in um, the food texture and consistency. They may have to be on a liquid diet or a mechanical soft diet. And in some cases, if they really cannot chew, we may consider nutrition support, like tube feeding, because the problem is the entry of the food, the esophagus and the the stomach and intestines are still working fine, so we could, we could deliver the formula to the stomach or lower portion of the GI to ensure use of the patient's GI tract. Because the ability to chew and ingest is compromised, we want to make sure that we can design a diet that would increase nutrient density. So this is very important. Um, we want to make every bite count. We will also need to educate the patient so that they know how to ensure adequacy and uh, food safety for the food pre preparation. And at this stage, one thing we need to check is that um, all food should be able to be uh, moved easily through a syringe or straw because their ability to chew is affected, we would want the food to be soft or um, a liquid with a consistent texture. We also mentioned that in some cases, oral intake may not be possible, but the remaining sections of the GI still work, um, so we could consider enteral nutrition. And just to note here, this is an example of a pureed diet, so they wouldn't really have to chew and you can see here they use molds, so um, the food kind of um, appear, still appears appetizing, not just globs of mashed up food. Here are some tips for nutrition therapy for those that have a jaw fracture. Um, basically, everything has to be blenderized. Modification to texture and the consistency of the food is key for these patients. 
There are also things we can do to include extra protein, um, which is helpful for wound healing. And there's ways that we can uh, create extra calories in the diet as well. So looking at this, the way to increase the calorie content would be to add extra fat or sugar. These would be the foods and beverages we um, would limit when our goal is weight loss, but right now our concern is the opposite with malnutrition caused by uh, compromised oral intake or inadequate intake. So we want to try and beef it up with as many calories as possible. Another thing uh, to also mention is to be aware of the temperature of the foods and liquids. If someone has their jaw wired shut, you know, to decrease the mo uh, movement of it, we do not want to be serving them hot liquids that could burn their mouth. Uh, for example, uh, once I've had a patient that had his jaw wired shut and he really wanted to drink tea, but since we could not serve him the hot beverages, we would just make the tea ourselves in the kitchen and allow it to cool near room temperature before we went up and served it to him. There are also different conditions that can cause alterations in taste perception. Dysgeusia means that the person tasting something is tasting something differently than it would normally taste. Agasia means that the person cannot taste anything. So if we remember the prefix a means not, so not tasting. The ability to taste is essential for us to enjoy eating. The flavor can drive us to seek certain food or beverage items. However, there are diseases or medical conditions that do not allow us to taste normally or completely take away our ability to taste. And this is problematic because everything, once everything tastes bland, um, then we may lose interest in eating. So this could lead to anorexia, loss of appetite, and then this anorexia could contribute to decreased dietary intake, and that could put us at a high risk for malnutrition. So we have some common causes here, uh, chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and these are known factors that can lead to impaired taste. Unfortunately, as we mentioned earlier, the impact could last much longer than, say, the completion of the therapy. Some may lead to permanent damage, especially um, radiation. We also may have diseases that affect the taste buds. So, um, For example, if we have inflammation or other things that affect the taste buds, uh, and the taste buds have the receptors for the molecules that give us taste, uh, these receptors are able to capture the stimuli and transduct the signal to the region of the brain that processes the signal to allow us to sense different tastes. But if these receptors on the taste buds are damaged, then this process is not possible because we never receive the message in our brains. If something is wrong with the nervous system, either the transduction of the signal to the brain are affected or the centers processing the signal in the brain are compromised, then we wouldn't be able to taste either. So anything that happens in the receiving delivery and the processing of the signal could affect our ability to taste. And uh, medications can also alter or impair taste. And uh, the enrichment piece is tongue essential to taste. Uh, you may have heard previously that Dr. Wong has been working with an individual that was born without a tongue. And our research with them indicates that this person is able to taste everything, including those everything that um, a person who are, 
is born with a tongue can taste and including wine, which I actually worked on him for my, um, worked on with him for my master thesis. So this is an indicator that the tongue is not essential to taste because the person without a tongue can taste everything as a normal person. Then obviously the next question would be, how are they doing this? What other structures in the mouth cavity other than the taste buds can help capture the signals and transduct the signal to the brain center for processing? Also, we can ask, what is the significance of the findings? Well, we just mentioned that some disease conditions and some treatments may permanently damage taste buds. Right now, when that happens, say after radiation or surgical removal of the tongue, neither the patients or the doctors expect much um, for taste. And this is because they think, okay, they have no tongue, so they're not going to have any taste. Therefore, the main focus is to um, figure out some rehabilitation protocols in these patients for speech and swallowing. So currently, the main focus for these individuals is for rehab in speech and swallowing. But now that we have proven that there, it is possible to taste without the tongue, this opens the door to new rehab strategies for these patients because we do need to do something about their taste rehab post-treatment in order to decrease their risk for malnutrition. We already mentioned that if we have impaired taste, our appetite may drop, and this could contribute to an adequate intake and that depending on the condition or causes, usually impaired taste is accompanied by swallowing and chewing difficulties, those functional changes. Nutrition intervention, similar to what we discussed earlier, we may modify the distribution, the amount of food, and the type of food provided. More importantly, we're going to want to modify the texture or consistency of the food items. And this is obviously a concern for potential malnutrition. So for the monitoring and evaluation, We'll need to observe how much the patient is able to eat and conduct calorie counts or log a food diary if necessary. This way we can know exactly how much they are actually consuming.